As covered in lecture 8, the time response of first and second order transfer functions are well understood and easy to characterize, but it's much more difficult to calculate the time response of higher order systems. One way to make such systems easier to think about is to approximate them by a lower order transfer function using a technique called the dominant pole approximation. This approximation assumes that the slowest part of the system dominates the response and that the faster parts of the system can be ignored. This is the focus of this lecture. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to understand the concept of dominant poles, recognize the influence of zeros in the transient response, and simplify a transfer function to a lower order. Let's start with this example. The roll control autopilot of an aircraft has the following structure. The closed loop transfer function y over r would result in a third order transfer function. How can, how can you calculate the value of the parameter k that yields an overshoot of less than 2%? With the tools developed in lecture 8, this would not be feasible, because all systems we study so far are first or second order. In order to answer this question, we have to find an approximation and lower the order of this system to a second order system, and then apply the tools we learned in lecture 8. This concept can be applied to any higher order system, such as this one. A mechanical pump is designed to support heart function and blood flow in people with weak hearts. It turns out the transfer function of this pump would be a third order transfer function. In order to analyze the time response of this system, the order will need to be lowered to a second order using an approximation, so that all the tools developed in lecture 8 can be applied. Let's start our analysis with a first order system. Consider the response of the first order system to a step unit input. The first order system has a transfer function 1 over s plus a, and 1 over s characterizes the step input. Using partial fraction decomposition, we can split this function into two, that is 1 over a over s minus 1 over a divided by s plus a. And this now makes the inverse Laplace easy, it's simply 1 over a minus 1 over a exponential of negative a t, and now 1 over a can be factored out to yield the following expression. This is the time response of that system to a step input. The transfer function has one pole, and this pole is located at s equals to negative a, where a is a real number. How does the magnitude of a influence the transient response? Let's just start by placing the pole a on the s plane. a is a real number and thus lies on the real axis. So long as a is a negative number that is, is located on the left side of the s plane, then the exponential given here will decay to 0 and the system will settle at 1 over a. Now how does the magnitude of a influence the transient response? We can attempt to plot the time response and we know that this will settle at 1 over a. It's the final value. And the system will reach 1 minus a following an exponential. Let's assume that this exponential is obtained when a is placed in this particular location. If now the magnitude of a increases, that is a moves to the left, what happens to this exponential? Well, the exponential is a function of negative a t. The greater the magnitude of a, the faster the exponential decays. In this case, the time response would resemble this curve. On the other hand, if you now move a closer to the imaginary axis, the magnitude of a decreases and the exponential will now take longer to decay, resulting in a slower system. We can conclude that the farther a is from the imaginary axis, the faster the system reaches a steady state. The closer A is to the imaginary axis, the less time the system will take to reach a steady state. Let's apply the same concept to a second order system now. Let's examine the step response of P over S plus 1 times S plus P, where P is a constant, a real number. 1 over S represents the step input. If we now divide the top and the bottom of this equation by P, we get 1 over S plus 1 times 1 over P S plus 1 times 1 over S. In order to find the inverse Laplace, that is x of t, we need to first find the partial fraction decomposition of this part of the expression. This will result in three fr partial fractions, one for each pole, and after taking the inverse Laplace transform, we find x of t given in the center. We see now three terms, the final value, 1, that comes from the step input, the terms that comes from s plus 1, and the term that comes from 1 over ps plus 1. As time tends to infinity, these two exponentials will tend to zero, provided that the pole is a negative number, and the system will eventually settle at one. Now let's plot this expression and separate these two terms, the one that originates from the pole at one and one that originates at the pole at negative p. 
the dashed line represents the contribution of the pole at negative 1 to the time response, and the solid line represents the contribution of the pole at negative p on the time response. Now let's vary p and see what happens to these time responses. In the first term, that is the pole at negative 1, as p is increased, that is it increases from this line to that line, we can notice that the curve becomes faster, it reaches 0, it decays to 0 faster. And let's also look at the second term, which is the contribution of the pole at negative p on the time response. As p increases, we see that now the exponential decays faster, and the magnitude of the second term also decreases. Thus, when p is very large, the magnitude of the second term will tend to zero, and also the exponential component associated with it will decay very fast. In conclusion, if p is much greater than 1, that is, the magnitude of the second pole is much greater than the magnitude of the other pole, then the term created by p, that is 1 over p minus 1 exponential of negative pt, is negligible and can be ignored. We can look at the combined effect of all three elements, and this is what you have. Term 1 plus term 2 plus 1. And as p increases, the system becomes faster. It reaches a steady state faster. And the transient that we see here is mostly coming from the first term. Because the second term magnitude is tending to zero and it's decaying very fast. We can now say that the pole that is closer to the imaginary axis dominates the time response. And by dominating we mean it takes longer to decay and it's responsible for all the transients that we observe here. Whereas the transients generated by the second pole under the condition that a p is much greater than one than the other pole can be neglected. This idea is summarized in this graph. On the S-plane you can distinguish two main regions, the stable region that is the left side of the S-plane and the unstable region the right side of the S-plane. If any poles of the transfer function are located in the unstable region, that is the real part is positive, the entire system is unstable. If the real part of all poles are located on the left side of the S-plane as the, the system converges to a final value, the system is said to be stable. We can identify two regions in this stable region now, the region of dominant poles and the region of insignificant poles. Let's assume that we have two poles, let's place one pole here and one pole there. This pole has a magnitude of A, this pole has a magnitude of B. We know that both poles will be associated with an exponential response. A will create an exponential in this form, whereas B will create an exponential in this form. If B is much greater than A, then B decays much faster than the exponential created by A, and thus B can be neglected. A takes longer to decay to zero, A is said to dominate the time response of the system. If the magnitude of the real part of a pole is at least 5 to 10 times of that of a dominant pole, then the pole may be regarded as insignificant. So if the magnitude of B is at least 5 or 10 times that of A, then you can say that a B has an insignificant contribution in the time response and can be neglected. The pole that is the closest to the imaginary axis is this lowest one, is the one that dominates the time response. Let's consider another example. Now let's look at a third order transfer function. We have a second order transfer function in the standard form and you have a additional pole located at s equals to 1 over gamma. The additional pole is a real pole, and the real part of that pole is negative 1 over gamma. The real part of the poles from the second order transfer function, as we saw in lecture 8, is negative zeta times omega n. You can now say that if the magnitude of the additional pole 1 over gamma is at least 10 times higher than the magnitude of the real part of the other poles, that is 10 times zeta omega n, then this third order system can be approximated by a second order system given here. The additional pole would create an exponential that would decay much faster than the poles of the second order part. Let's take a numerical example. Take omega n equals to 1 and sigma equals to 0 0.45. For these values of omega n and sigma, there are two poles located at s equals to negative 0 0.45 plus minus 0 0.89i. The real part of the pole is negative 0 0.45. In example 1, let's take gamma equals to 1. This adds a pole to s equals to 1. The magnitude of this pole is only about twice as high as the other pole. Thus, this additional pole cannot be neglected. 
In example 2, gamma is 0 0.22. This adds a pole to S equals to negative 4.5. The magnitude of this additional pole is exactly 10 times that of the other pole, which is 0 0.45. In this case, the pole at negative 4.5 could be neglected. And the transfer function could be simplified to TA. In example 3, gamma equals to 0 0.1, which adds a pole at negative 10. Negative 10 is more than 10 times greater than negative 0.45. This allows one to write the third order transfer function with a second order approximation. Now let's see how close this approximation is. This function has three poles, two complex conjugates, and the additional pole at negative one over gamma. We are now concerned with the difference in the real part of this pose, that is this distance. Depending on this distance, the pole at negative 1 over gamma may be neglected. The dominant pole, or this lowest pole, in this case are the complex conjugate numbers because they are closer to the imaginary axis. If the magnitude of negative 1 over gamma is much greater than negative 0.45, then this pole can be neglected and we can now reduce the order of the transfer function to a second order transfer function. Let's reconsider the three examples from the previous slide. In the first one, gamma equals to 1, which adds a pole at a negative 1. And as we saw, that is not a good approximation because the magnitude of the added pole is only twice as high as the magnitude of the dominant pole. If we now plot the original third order function and the approximated second order function, we see a big gap between them, a big discrepancy. The simplification doesn't hold in this case. In the second example, gamma is 0 0.22, which adds a pole at negative 4.5. Negative 4.5 is indeed 10 times the magnitude of the other pole, zeta omega n, which means that the additional pole can be neglected. Here we see the plots of both functions and you see that they are pretty close. The approximation in this case is acceptable. And in the third case, the magnitude of the additional pole is more than 20 times that of the dominant pole. If we plot the time response of both functions, we see that they are indeed very close together, very similar which means that the second order approximation holds very well. Now that I've covered the influence of additional poles, we can look at the addition of zeros. Consider the standard second order transfer function with the additional zero at s equals to negative z. And we divide the function by z to keep the same final value, which in this case is 1. We should see that if the magnitude of the real part of the zero is much greater than the magnitude of the real part of the poles, the zero will have a minimal effect on the step response. Equation two can be, can be split into two functions. The first term is obtained by multiplying omega n z with z, which results in omega n squared, gives this term. The second one is obtained by multiplying omega n squared over z with s, and this gives the second term. Let's call the first term x of s. If this term is x of s, then here we also have x of s, and the entire second term can be written as x of s times s divided by z. If x of t is the inverse Laplace of x of s, then this term gives x of t. And the second term now is simply x of s times s, which means x of t dot, the derivative of x divided by the constant z. So the second term simplifies to 1 over z times the time derivative of x of t. What can we conclude here? The time response of the transfer function with no zeros plus an additional term that now depends on the derivative of the time response without zeros divided by z. Notice that this adds a component to the time response that only appears when the derivative of the time response is non-zero. When x is changing over time, then x dot or the derivative of x with respect to time is not zero and that will add a component to the time response. If x is constant, then the derivative is zero and the second term is negligible. This means that the additional zero speeds up transients, making rises and falls sharper. The additional zero does not affect the steady state because in the steady state, x of dot of t equals to zero and we are left with the original part. However, if x changes over time, then the derivative is not zero and that adds a component to it. The initial statement was that if the real part of the zero is much greater than the real part of the pole, the zero will have minimal effect on the step response.
and this can be seen here. The greater z, the greater the real part of the zero, the smaller the influence of the zero will be in, this, in the transient response. 1 over z will tend to zero. Here is a numerical example. With omega n equals to 1, zeta equals to 0 0.45, and you're going to vary the value of z from 1 to 10. You can see that by decreasing z, the transients will get higher and higher. Remember that at the time response y of t was x of t, that is, the response without a zero, plus 1 over z times x dot. It's derivative. The smaller z, the more important this term becomes, and this term, because it depends on the derivative of x, only acts during transients. And you see in this part, the transients are getting more important as z is decreased. No change in the steady state value though, because in the steady state, this term is zero. We are using a simplification method to lower the order of a system. There are more precise approaches. We can, for example, match the frequency response of a high order system with a lower order system. There are many mathematical methods for this purpose. This is only for information, it's not going to be covered in this lecture. But there are mathematical tools to approximate the response of a third order polynomial with a second order polynomial by reducing the error between them. The idea is to find the coefficients of the polynomial that will lead to the best approximation. Here are the equations, this is all covered in the textbook, feel free to look at it if you're interested. But for the purpose of control systems, the approximation using the dominant poles and zeros is sufficient. Once again, let's look at the location of poles in the S-plane and what they represent. For a second-order transfer function, the roots can be obtained using the quadratic equation. Here they are. Zeta omega n is the real part of the pole, is omega n, times the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. By placing a pole on the S-plane, we are specifying the imaginary part of the pole and the real part of the pole. The distance to the origin is the magnitude of S, that is the magnitude of the pole, that is simply the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared, square root. This simplifies to this term will cancel that term and you're left with omega n. Thus the distance of the pole to the origin is the natural frequency. And as we saw before, the angle of this line with the imaginary axis, call that angle theta, sine of theta is simply zeta omega n divided by omega n. So theta is sine minus one of zeta, the damping ratio. By placing a pole on the S-plane, you are specifying the entire time response of the system. Now, in addition, for more than one pole, looking at the magnitude of the real part of poles on the S-plane, it is now possible to determine which ones will dominate the time response and which ones can be neglected. To conclude, let's look at the simple example taken from a midterm examination. Based on the given unit step response h of t of the function h of s shown below, what temporal signal best describes the unit step response of g of s? We are given h of s, and we are given the plot of h of t, the inverse of h of s, given here. Based on that, which one is g of s? We can see that a g of s can be split into two fractions, 10 over s squared plus 2s plus 10, and plus 10s s squared plus 2s plus 10. The first term turns out to be h of s, which means that the second term is h of s times s. So g of t is h of t plus h of t dot. If h of t is given here, which one is g of t? Is it g1? Now it cannot be g1 because the final value here is 0. And the final value of this is the final value of h of t, that is 1. Is it g3? They cannot be g3 because we are taking h of t and adding its own derivative. g of 3 has a smaller magnitude than h of t, so it cannot be g3. The solution is g2. If you compare the curves, the difference between h of t and g of t is that g of t is h of t plus its own derivative. And this is clearly given by g2. When g of t increases, so the magnitude of g of t should be greater than h of t. When h of t decreases, then the slope is negative, the derivative is negative, and the magnitude of g of t decreases compared to h of t. So the answer to this question is g2, that is option b. Let's do some more exercises, they will be posted in separate videos. Thank you.